writes great columns, great podcasts. So um, I think that there are two things that are different about the current crisis. Uh, you know, maybe Chad and Waleed have some uh, additional ones, but uh, there's two things that really explain our collective failure to deal with this pandemic more effectively. I think, I think the first is, and this is really fundamental, the social cost of failed supply chains, the social cost, the cost of society, it's just much higher than the private cost to individual firms. So, you know, a tsunami that delays delivery of cars by six months, I mean, that's not socially costly, but a pandemic that delays the delivery of PPE by six months, well, you know, that imposes huge societal costs. We must cope, you know, with the death of our loved ones, uh, Unfortunately, I'm sure that there are many who are listening in that have had that uh, unfortunate experience. That you know, we're all coping with the social isolation that seems to have no fixed end date. Uh, we're having firms and workers that are suffering unprecedented economic hardship. So there are many ways in which these hardships could have been lessened, but all of them start by recognizing a simple market failure. That the benefits of building long-term supply relationships for PPEs, et cetera, are much higher for society than they are for individual firms. And that leads to a very simple conclusion. There's an important role for government. And, I, I, and this is something that we, nobody is talking about, but it, it really has to be stated. Unfortunately, not only did private firms fail us, but not only did as well governments failed us because they weren't adequately prepared. But I have to say that we bear some of the responsibility personally as voters because as voters, we failed our government by not being sufficiently demanding of our very capable public officials. We become very narrow in our view of what the appropriate role for government is, and we become overly skeptical of the ability of government to execute on its mandates. And what, what we ended up with is a government that we wanted, a government that was not sufficiently engaged in managing our supply chains for these critical goods. So that, that's the first issue, that there's this big, um, uh, market failure, that the, the, it's more valuable to society to manage these supply chains than to individual firms. And the second one is a little bit more technical. You know, it's that the current, um, the current crisis is a little different than past crises. In past crises, there's, the shocks were often idiosyncratic. They hit a single country, like a tsunami hits Japan. But the current crisis, the shocks are correlated across countries. And that has important implications when we're dealing with GVCs. And, and this is a way to think about it. There's sort of two models of, uh, and this is the, my, sort of my last point. There's two models of how the, the world functions. In the first, uh, you know, each country does its own thing. It, it builds everything it needs and it doesn't rely on any other countries. And when we think about that world, you know, sort of harkens back to an old time when, you know, the first settlers arrived in Canada and suffered the winters and planted their crops. And they were very, I think the word we use, they were very resilient. Shocks came and went, they managed to survive and get by. There's another model. And this one is in which we are in highly integrated societies in which each country depends on the other country. This is, the, this is the model of globalization, which we squeeze out all these efficiency gains in which we're obsessed with efficiency. So we have two models of the world, one which emphasizes the advantages of resiliency and one which emphasizes the advantages of efficiency. And here's the, the, the key point is that in, when we have shocks that are idiosyncratic to individual countries, like a tsunami in Japan, this efficiency model of globalization works very well. But when it's correlated across countries, then this, then this efficiency model stops working very well. And the resiliency model is the one that works better. Thank you for yeah. that, Ben. And that gives us a, a, a really helpful perspective to think about uh, global supply chains and when they work and when they don't. So Chad, maybe I could ask you in the current environment, there are many calls to change global supply chains to somehow bring back production to Canada, the US and other Western markets. Um, you know, Dan talked about the trade-offs here, but in your assessment, are these calls to bring back global supplies, are they well-founded or are they driven by Navarro politics uh, or solid sort of business public health concerns? So, so uh, first, let me say thank you for the, for the opportunity to be here. It's a, it's a, tremendous, it's a tremendous pleasure. Um, 
this is a it's a this is a huge question. I, I think a lot of it is um, sort of knee jerk reaction, people being scared, um, you know, policymakers saying to themselves, uh, you know, we, we need to deal with this uh, a crisis, the things that we can control now, we can't trust anybody but, you know, sort of ourselves. Um, and I think that's sort of the knee jerk reaction. But I think in a lot of respects, uh, it's actually the wrong reaction and, and can be kind of counterproductive. And, and so let me, let me go a little bit further into some of the points that, that Dan made. Um, you know, one of the things that I've spent the last two months studying in, 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 in far too much depth is what the supply chains and, and trade flows in things like, you know, this personal protective equipment, the PPEs, the masks and, and get hospital gowns and all of that kind of stuff comes from. Um, and, you know, at least in the United States, uh, we, we import a lot of that from, from China. Uh, we get some of it from Mexico as well. Some of it is regional. And I know we have, uh, you know, we're part of a supply chain with, with, with you all as well. But a lot of this uh, we were buying from, you know, from China, importing from China. And really what happened with this outbreak um, was, was very much kind of the, the, a perfect storm of events. So for one, there was already a bit of a supply chain disruption that was happening um, that was completely unrelated to the coronavirus outbreak, but because of the trade war. So, but because of the trade war, the Trump administration had imposed tariffs on respirators and surgical masks in, in 2019, already making it more difficult for American hospitals, at least, and medical providers to be able to provide, to be able to buy, purchase this equipment from China, you know, the world's largest, the American's largest uh, source of foreign supply of these things. And, you know, my sense is the hospital systems hadn't quite worked that out. They hadn't figured out who the alternative suppliers should be, if they should continue buying from China, but just at higher prices. So we were already at, at a bit of a uh, stage of disruption of a supply chain, lack of adequate preparedness, and then the shock hit, right? And then the shock hits kind of in the worst possible way. It starts off in China, um, which is the largest supplier of a lot of this equipment. And obviously China's natural reaction is to, you know, have huge demand for, for this equipment for itself to try to, you know, back in January, it was the only place suffering from this. So it had a huge increase in the need for respirators and masks. It ramped up production as quickly as it could, but it needed a lot of this stuff internally. And that meant fewer exports available for, for the rest of the world as well. And so you had kind of this perfect storm of events all taken, some of it self-inflicted. I think the trade war you could argue was, was self-inflicted, but, um, but the events sort of taking place in, in China itself is originating in China and, the, and thus making it more difficult for the rest of the world to be able to access some of these supplies when they needed it when, when sort of COVID ended up, uh, ended up on their shores, uh, created problems. So that then leads us to the question as well, you know, how should we, how should we think about this then? Uh, is it maybe a better solution would be to, you know, not have these supply chains? Um, let's forget for a moment kind of other political geostrategic challenges that you might have with being particularly reliant on China. But you know, let's just suppose that, that, that we did all of this ourselves in the United States or you did all of it yourself there in Canada. And I think the evidence has shown that that, that outcome doesn't work either. Um, and, you know, the, my favorite example, I don't know what you're going through there in Canada, but, you know, for the first six weeks, the, the, the sort of favorite story was our shortage of toilet paper here in the United States. Um, everybody's at home. Uh, and everybody wants to buy, you know, the very comfortable, nice, cushy toilet paper, but none of it's available. And the story behind that is, is it's effectively a supply chain story, not an international global supply chain story. But essentially, there's, you know, there's, there's two different types of toilet paper being produced out there. There's stuff that, you know, for your office, commercial, public, it's very uncomfortable, nobody wants it. Uh, and then there's the home stuff. And the, the massive shift from the commercial to the home meant that there was just not enough of the home stuff available. There was lots of the other stuff available, but this then, you know, is sort of a lean supply chain story, but it has nothing to do with international trade, nothing to do with cross-border, nothing to do with China. It's just a massive shift in demand. And there's sort of no amount of preparedness that could have left us ready for, for that kind of outcome. So I think it's, it's you know, presents politicians that might have ulterior motives with saying, ah, we need to bring supply chains back. Um, but I don't think that is the solution. I think we have seen, you know, other examples would be in the United States, we've had the, 
shut down a lot of meatpacking facilities uh, for, for pork and beef because that's where they've had outbreaks of, of the pandemic uh, showing up for workers. Imagine those had been not meatpacking plants, but those had been um, N95 respirator plants, right? Then we'd be desperate for, for that kind of material to come in from abroad, from, from countries that weren't suffering right at this moment. So I think it is a bit of a, a wrong reaction in terms of policy to think that the solution is going to be to say, let's bring back supply chains to only be here in our, our own country. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a super valuable point that it, the supply chain disruptions initially manifested as international, but now we're gonna see the domestic and what are we gonna do? Say that New York should not trade with Idaho? I mean. Yeah, so taking it to the limit. So, you know, Dan, you've often talked about the gift of disruption and this here is sort of a big disruptive event, getting lots of people thinking about you know, political changes, but also strategic changes for corporations. How should firms be thinking about this in the age of COVID? Uh, that's a great one. And, and this is a sort of a, a, a different mind shift because I think for most of us, it's crisis mode, blame mode, let's hunker down and just survive mode. But, you know, I, I, I talked to now uh, in the last uh, several weeks to dozens and dozens of startups uh, and, and seeing what uh, is happening in the newspapers as well. And it's extraordinary how in the midst of this crisis, there are many firms that are seeing this as a great opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. And it sounds, it sounds almost cliche, right, to lead, but you, we all know the Chinese character for crisis is actually two characters, right? Mm -hmm. Danger and opportunity. Uh, so, I'm looking around, I'm seeing these many, many opportunities. And if I'm in business, I wanna ask what opportunities are there for me? This is not all a disaster. Some of this is opportunity. So telehealth, which has languished for a decade, right? We, you know, people invested in telehealth, uh, like uh, Bernie Pell for 10 years, it's languishing. And now, you know, it's unbelievable what's happening to his portfolio. Why? Because it's a hot item. Doctors are using uh, telehealth to triage patients so they don't have to come into hospital. Psychiatrists are doing the unthinkable, the absolute unthinkable. Nobody thought that psychiatry could be done online. And lo and behold, we're doing it online and the psychiatrists are thrilled with it. Remote meetings. Nobody thought that we could, in the course of a weekend, take Rotman School of Management and turn it from an in in location, face-to-face -face classroom experience to a fully and completely online experience. Nobody thought we could do it. We, I'm sorry to sound like Trump. Nobody thought. <laughs> <laughs> we and many others did that transition in 72 hours. And now all of us are thinking remote me meetings, right? We're, we all realize that we're much more focused when we're at home. We're much more comfortable not having to take that 15-hour flight to Guangzhou. Oh my gosh, if I ever have to take that flight again. Uh, um, and we're, we're now focused on, uh, you know, the things that are more important to us rather than these distractions like traveling. So what does remote meetings mean for different types of companies? And then there's you know, all this other stuff that we could be doing. Like, I, I just, you see opportunities everywhere. There's two sterilization companies that my, my students from my class in Rotman are working with. That's just my students, for heaven's sakes. The Spartan testing that's come out of U of T, the vaccines, the clinical trials that Canada could take advantage of. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many opportunities out there and you have to ask as a company, you know, can I take advantage of disruptive change? Uh, we're doing it at Rotman in ways that we never imagined and we're a a public company, right? We're, we're government. So surely your private company can do better. Your company should be reimagining its future. And you have to remember that reimagining uh, your company and then sort of implementing will require a bet, right? Mm -hmm. A bet against the future. You don't know for sure that this is gonna work, but you gotta at least consider trying. And you know all that market research can help you shorten your odds. But in the end, a truly innovative strategy that's going to propel you into a new space, it's going to be a risky one. But you need to be thinking those terms. So, Dan, you talked about these two models, one based on efficiency and resilience. Now you're talking about all of this innovation. So, Chad, I'll put you on the spot and say, will the crisis lead to a rethink of global value change? What do you think? <laughs> 
Um, you know, I, I, I do think that, I think the combination of both this crisis um, and, you know, the, the sort of the relentlessness of the trade war, um, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, wasn't going away. Uh, even, you know, before the crisis hit, there was an agreement between the United States and China, but, you know, most all of the tariffs that the two sides had imposed on each other throughout the, throughout the trade war were still in place. Uh, and there was very much the sense that this might just be a political deal, um, you know, for the Trump administration to campaign on, for the president to campaign on before November. And so with that in mind, you know, I think companies that were, that were very focused globally, at least in Asia, were already thinking about what that would mean for their supply chains um, and whether it's resiliency or redundancy um, or restructuring things in light of, of the fact that, that you know, both policy might change in ways that they hadn't anticipated before 2016 or now certainly the size of this crisis um, and you know how how quickly it spread, and you know how even once we wrap our hands around it and, and resolve it, something like this you know could easily happen again. Yes, I think um, it won't be the end of globalization. It won't be the end of of, of supply chains. But I think companies are going to have to think about things quite differently than than they had recently. So a question just came in, which I'd like to ask now, but it's very much related to what you just said, uh, Chad. Uh, can, uh, should we uh, reconsider our industrial policies in Canada and the US to be selectively protective when it comes to certain goods like PPE ventilators and food supplies? How would you respond to that question? So I think there, um, there are definitely gonna be calls to, to, to do this. Um, I think a big question, I think one of the big concerns that I've had um, in terms of how government and policymakers have behaved um, during the crisis so far, is that there has been a stunning lack of cooperation and, and coordination globally. Yes. Um, where you sit in Canada is one of the few places that is thinking outside of your national borders at the moment. Um, you know, we saw early on in Europe in March, um, infighting between EU member states for, for PPE. Uh, you know, the Germans and the French uh, requisitioned the, 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 you know, respirators and masks and wouldn't even sell it to Italy, you know, the part of, of, of Europe uh, in the European Union that was suffering the most at that point in time. In the United States, in, in, in April, the Trump administration invoked the Defense Production Act and, and said, you know, we're not going to sell this stuff to Canada. Uh, eventually, they backed off um, and, and, and changed that, but that was a real big concern for a while. So I, I think given that that kind of that those kinds of policies have taken place um, there is definitely going to be an incentive for national governments to say look we need to worry about preparing ourselves our people better uh, i don't think you know for the reasons that we've talked about that's the best way to handle it because i think any of these shocks can happen at the national level as well and, and no one's immune i think a better approach is is to build up stockpiles strategic reserves more information uh, right now, one of the big problems is we know nothing about production, how much anybody can produce of, of this type of equipment, how much is being stored, uh, what consumption is. We have a little bit of information and a lag about trade, um, but without that information, it really does breed distrust and a sort of a lack of cooperation. We saw the same thing happen back in you know, 2008, 9, 10 during the financial crisis when it came to food, not in the rich countries, but especially in the, in the developing countries. Uh, developing world when there were lots of, uh, there's a commodity price spike and there were shortages of, of food. Uh, a lot of that stemmed from lack of information. And so what happened then is the G20 put forward a, a, a new monitoring system for, for key food crops to try to help resolve those types of problems. This might be another example for, for things like PPE and ventilators and all these kinds of critical equipment, the drugs, the vaccines, the therapeutics, once we get there, we just need much more information uh, so that countries and governments are comfortable engaging and cooperating with each other and we don't necessarily push toward this more nationalistic approach. Maybe if I could just ask you and then I'll come to you, Dan, but if you think about after 2008, it was a very different in terms of international cooperation versus, uh, versus today. What is it going to take to get 
to get us back to a situation where there's a lot of lot more international trust, international cooperation, rather than sort of a more unilateral approach, especially by the United States. Yeah, well, I, I think on the United States side, unfortunately, it's going to take a different administration. This administration just has no interest. You know, we've seen over the last three years how they've treated the World Trade Organization uh, outside of trade, you know, what, what they've done on climate, what they've done uh, toward Iran, you know, and, and, and breaking deals that, that, that had been implemented. So I don't think you're going to see any leadership coming out of the Americans, unfortunately, um, when it comes to thinking about global cooperation and coordination. And I do think this is a big problem. I think the next concern, you know, that we potentially face, once we get beyond this initial phase of, of the health uh, concerns with, with the crisis is, you know, when we start to begin to reopen our economies again uh, and trade flows begin to start to resume yeah. and that, that starts to happen on an asynchronous basis and we start to see, you know, China or Asia opening before we do here or Europe, there may be calls for, for protection. And back in 2008, 2009, you had the group of 20, um, the, the leaders of all the, the major economies came forward and said, we're not going to do any of that kind of stuff. The leaders, um, the presidents, the prime ministers, they, they, they all agreed to not do that kind of stuff. We're not seeing any of that uh, being taken up today. Uh, we're seeing smaller initiatives, including a number that have been taken by Canada uh, with, another, with other kind of smaller open economies with the Australia's, the New Zealand's of the world. But unfortunately, largely absent from a lot of those, the United States is entirely absent, but also missing is frequently Europe. Uh, and, and even China. So I think that's something that, that's very different today that, that, that I find at least worrisome. Yeah, so so Dan, maybe I can ask you what can your I take just, is. Go ahead. Just, yeah, just to add a, a couple, two things to what uh, Chad was saying. You know, you're, the person who asked the question said uh, industrial policy. They sort of elevated what is really a relatively minor intervention in a really circumscribed set of goods to the to, you know, the, using language to suggest that this is an industrial policy. This isn't an industrial policy. This is very precisely targeted interventions. This is, when you say industrial policy, it makes like, it sounds like, oh, we shouldn't be in the business of picking winners and losers. And, uh, you know, this is not the, the place for government. It is the place for government. It's not industrial policy. It's not picking winners. There's nothing ideological here. That's the first thing. To, the, so we, we've got to take the high ground on language here. It's nothing about industrial policy. The second thing is to just re, to, to say how much I agree with Chad that in the end, we are in between a rock and a hard place right now with international cooperation. And it is not in Canada's interest, and I believe it's not in the interest of any country, including China and the United States, to continue the state of affairs. And we are going to have to find as many touchstones as possible for international cooperation. And maybe as we go along in this discussion, you know, we can rattle off another dozen. When we spoke earlier, Dan, you told me to be positive. So I'm going to ask you, are, uh, what's your outlook? Uh, do you feel optimistic? Do I feel optimistic? Um, there's a short and long run of this. Uh, so. In the short run, and I'm an economist, and uh, I have a good sense of the importance of what I do. And yet, in the short run, we are still pinned down by science. And that is, we have still have very unclear ideas about how this uh, disease unfolds. We don't know how many people have it, how long they have it for, how long they shed the virus. We don't know what the you know false negatives on, on testing. We don't know what the vaccine is going to look like. We don't know if the production, the time it takes to produce seven you know, billion uh, vaccines. There's so much science that we don't understand. My role, I feel, as an economist is to recognize that the most important thing right now is the science of it, to make sure it's well-funded. That, I, I'm not either optimistic or pessimistic. I just think we need to be reminded that there is a fundamental epidemiological issue here and I trust the scientists to do as best they can, much more than I trust the private sector to just rattle off solutions which get them grants from governments. Okay. Um, in the long run, am I optimistic? Of course, of course, Waleed. There are so many opportunities here and um, this will transform the world for the to a better place, I hope. 
And before I go to an, a question to Chad, there's just one question and uh, we've already touched on it, but I think this is an MBA student looking for a stock tip is really what it is. But um, as a result, after, after we get a vaccine, do you see manufacturing in Canada, in the US somehow surging or uh, changing the trajectory it was on before? What are your thoughts on that? Chad, Dan? Um, I mean, uh, for uh, manufacturing a vaccine, I mean, absolutely. I think this is one of the big concerns. Um, and I, I agree with Dan too. I think our, our job as economists is to try to explain to folks the trade-offs and then get out of the way and let the scientists do their job and, and kind of help us get through this. Um, my big concern, while I'm a long run optimist as well, uh, my, my big concern at the moment um, with, the, with the current political frameworks is you know, that we could see nationalism showing up next um, you know, when it comes to things like vaccines. And so you know, us producing here in the United States, but only for us, uh, other countries perhaps doing the same thing as well. So yes, I, I, I do see manufacturing of that kind of thing taking place. Do I see a major change in the manufacturing economy in the United States because of this? Again, uh, not really. You know, kind of the, the general trends in, in manufacturing, maybe some production, uh, but the general trends in, in manufacturing in terms of employment um, with technology, it's just, you know, it, it, it's never going to go back to the way things were in the 1950s, the 1960s, 1970s, I think. Uh, that's a really important message. Um, and I think a lot of people somehow think, may, maybe spurred on by Trump, thinking that they could bring back the manufacturing economy. One, one sort of thread through some of these questions, I'd like you each just to, you know, um, to think maybe in the US and in Canada, might the rise of nationalism, particularly in the US, impact immigration flows, immigration flows to an extent more than what we've already seen? Because we've already seen it in the U.S. Maybe Dan, you can start in Canada. Do you see uh, any backlash on immigration? Um, I do. Uh, uh, we're not speaking about this, and um, uh, it needs to be talked about. the uh, The first thing that's going to happen, I, I suspect, is we're going to have to confront what we do with the temporary workers program over the summer, because. Those temporary workers, you know, 50% from Mexico, with you know, uh, Guatemala and uh, Jamaica taking up a big piece of the rest of it, they're the ones that pick the crops that are going to be essential for our supply chain. Uh, if we don't have those workers, uh, we're going to have to rethink uh, how we how we deliver food to the Canadians. So that's going to be the first wake-up call to Canadians about exactly how how dependent we are and thankful we are for that temporary workers program. Uh, then we're going to, uh, I suspect, uh, you know, my view is that immigration should be something which is pro-cyclical, not counter-cyclical. So, uh, but that, you know, this is largely, I think, a political rather than an economic decision. But uh, on a pro-cyclical, I think we need to take a pause and ask ourselves at a time when we have scared, let me step back this, let me step this back. My view has always been, we need immigration in Canada. It's been extremely positive, but when we bring something to Canada, we have an absolute responsibility to make sure that that uh, immigrant is well integrated into Canadian society. And that is cost initially resources. We get paid back for it in spades later on, but it initially costs resources. In a downturn, we may not have the, the resources for that. So I'm a little concerned in the short run. Doesn't mean that we have to have a long run we think of immigration policy, but I think we need to be prepared for the fact that if we can't, you know, roll out the red carpet right and, and which we must for our immigrants, then we need to be a little bit, you know, sparing in the short run. Chad, maybe you can give us an American perspective. Yeah, I, I think um, I don't don't disagree with that. I think um, we're already seeing signs of it, you know, getting worse in the United States in terms of shutting borders. Uh, and obviously, I think we have an even bigger reliance on um, on temporary workers for agriculture. You know, in our, in our sector, especially California. So I think this is going to be very, very problematic um, over the next couple of months. Yeah. So, Chad, I'm going to ask you a question that I've asked many times before. I've never asked it in the context of the COVID crisis, but and you've kind of touched on it before. But I'd like to sort of uh, to get you to um, to, to answer this question directly. 
Ed Luce from the Financial Times wrote a book called The Retreat of Western Liberalism, where he talks about this thing called the snap back. And I think many people in Canada, many people on this webinar somehow believe that if Donald Trump were to lose the next election and a Democrat, a Joe Biden, were to win, somehow life would go back to normal. Lou speculated in his book that this would not happen, that the U.S. had fundamentally changed and Trump was in some sense a reflection, not just the cause of it. Not sure if you agree, but as a result of this pandemic, uh, what do you foresee? Um, would a change in government in the U.S., would that be enough to get us back to where we were before, or do you see there's some significant changes that have that have occurred? Yeah. So, I, mean, I guess how far back is 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 a big question. Is it you know just as far back as where we were in December, or are we talking you know back in in 2016? Um, I think in the United States right now, if we, if we want to stop and talk for a moment about uh, China and U.S.-China relations, um, there is very bipartisan um, concerns with with China, and I think you've already started to see that with the with the Biden campaign. Um, you know, it's I think we're going to see it get worse. The rhetoric from both candidates um, between now and November who can be seen to be you know, tougher on China, saying worse things about China. And that's gonna be difficult to pivot from you know, if uh, candidate Vice President Biden were to win in November. Um, I, I think a different uh, policy approach toward China might evolve under a Biden administration than if the Trump administration has a second term. You would probably see more global cooperation with other countries um, with Canada, with Europe, with Japan, uh, many whom obviously have similar concerns with China, whether it be on the trade side and concerns about you know, subsidies and state-owned enterprises, intellectual property rights protection, those kinds of things, or it's other more geostrategic or, or human rights. Um, you know, there might be, I would expect there would be more of a willingness to collaborate and, and to use alternative forum to engage like-minded similar valued countries um, with the American approach that would be quite different from what we've seen from the Trump administration over the last three years. So on China, same sentiment, but probably a different strategy. Yeah, but with, with COVID, let me just one, one point on COVID and then I'll, and I'll stop. Um, that's, I think another, you know, sort of monkey wrench in the works. Um, a big question is, you know, do we, is this sort of a new 9-11 which just causes the United States in a bipartisan way to look extremely inward for, for a period of time. Um, I, I'm like Dan, I'm an optimist. I, I think this crisis has presented us with opportunities to fight some of the you know, global challenges. Um, now that we've been confronted with this one, we can maybe double down on our efforts on climate and other things too, but I'm worried. I'm not yet sure what, what, the, um, what the future holds for, for sort of the American sentiment on these topics. Yeah, I, and I, I would add, uh, because I so agree with uh, Chad, as I have so often not only agreed, but been informed by uh, in the past. Uh, you know, Waleed, we get a little confused about what the Trump means as a word. Uh, it really, it means two things. One, we all agree that something has to be done that changes the relations between Western countries and China. Uh, everybody agrees, the Chinese agree, the West agrees. Trump was perhaps the most uh, clear to the public about that, though Obama had been doing lots of stuff in the background in the, before Trump came around. What we've conflated is the goal, which many of us agree on, and Biden agrees on, and Xi Jinping agrees on, with how we get there. And this is the problem with Trump, it's how we get there. For him, we get there by abandoning the institutions that have created so much success for us, both domestically and internationally, where the U.S. has taken the lead on institution building around the world. The, the approach the administration has taken is confrontational to tear down international institutions like the WTO. Instead of negotiating against China immediately, they start to fight with Canada. Then they start to fight with China, I mean, with the, the EU, and then a little bit with, you know, with Japan. When at the, what they should have been doing instead of renegotiating NAFTA, 
was creating a coalition around the world to rethink the China relationship. And it should have been institution building, not institution destroying. That's what Trump has been so ineffective at. Yeah. And you know, a, a question just came in related and you're both, you're both officially optimists. I've written that down because you both have said that, but thinking optimistically, what do you see as the low hanging fruit uh, for establishing greater international cooperation and coordination? Any thoughts on that? Yes, lots. And, and I know Chad has too. Go ahead, you start, Dan. Okay. Um, first of all, the WTO has to be fixed. Uh, everybody agrees it has to be fixed. The US has killed the WTO by destroying the, uh, the appellate body, which is the crown jewel of the system. Uh, so we need international cooperation to fix the WTO. China has come to the table to, I don't like their proposals, but they're at least at the table to discuss fixing the WTO. United States is not. United States has to come to the table. And there's ways of doing that. Uh, Chad will know even better than I some of the ways that are already happening. But beyond that, the opportunity that this crisis presents is instead of the mudslinging and blame throwing, bl the blame game that we're playing, we can move on to think about all the constructive things. And, and this is why I think Bill Gates has been so well received in the news because it is a positive story that he's trying to present to us. He's saying, you know, you know, look, there is all this stuff that we could be doing. We, to coordinate on healthcare internationally. You know, we have this WHO uh, R&D blueprint that's been advocated. Trump, of course, underfunding the WTO. We have the International Severe Acute Respiratory. We have the Emerging Infection Consortium. This, you know, we have a, a global research collaboration. The Canadian government has given a billion dollars to an EU-led initiative to, uh, you know, to take us through the whole process of dealing with pandemics, to ultimately to producing vaccines. This is, this is a moonshot. This is putting a man on the moon. And instead of this being a race between, you know, the Sputnik and the Americans and, and later the Chinese and the Indians, instead of this being who can get there fastest, this can be how can the whole world get there fastest. That's a message that resonates across race, across religion, across borders. That's a message that Canadians are pushing. And I would like to see, uh, you know, I would love to see that as being a launch pad for a great global moonshot, which is the elimination of global pandemics. Okay. Chad? I think the, the only thing that I would add is sometimes um, folks like Dan and I are challenged by, you know, being able to convince it it's worth funding, sinking the time and effort and resources into pursuing these really, really important ideas because, you know, the world doesn't know what the counterfactual is, how bad things would get if we don't do that. Well, we've had a lot of experiences now <laughs> about what happens when we don't do the right thing and just how scary it is and where it, where it is that we end up. So I think hopefully people will be, you know, certainly Americans will, will do a lot of self-reflection and say, wow, you know, the, the last couple of years, that's not great. You know, we don't, we don't wanna have that happen again. Uh, let's figure out the right way um, to, to build institutions, to cooperate, um, to make sure that that kind of thing, you know, that we can really learn the lessons that we need to take away from, from that whole experience. So the, the importance of international cooperation is really important, but another question very much related to this, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer it, but if you think about sort of a international cooperation to try to come up with the vaccine, what happens if one particular country gets the vaccine first how do we ensure how that gets distributed globally? Any thoughts on that? Sure. Jack, do you want to go first? Or? Yeah, so this is one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about at the moment and in, in trying to write something down. Um, and so if your folks have ideas, please tell them to me so that I can steal their intellectual property. Okay. So um, one of, one I think, why, why it's critical is obvious, right? That doesn't, that case doesn't need to be even really made. Um, you know, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Um, you know, there's humanitarian reasons, uh, et cetera. So, it, you know, it, it doesn't need to be explained. Uh, that being said, the concern is that once some country comes up with a vaccine, they're going to hoard it and they're going to nationalize it. Um, I think one way 
that you can kind of prevent that from happening is by leveraging and taking advantage and, and realizing the benefits of these supply chains. So, you know, in all likelihood, um, suppose we get, you know, that we come up with the vaccine first in the United States or, or you do in Canada. Uh, we're probably not going to have all of the inputs we need locally to be able to scale up that vaccine production um, quickly. We're going to need to import stuff from the rest of the world, whether it be, you know, the vials or the caps or the, the, the active pharmaceutical ingredients or, or other things that we need to be able to do it. That should be, you know, a mechanism to force countries to, to, to keep themselves open, to live up to a deal that says, if I promise to make some of this available to the rest of the world, once I, you know, start making it, that I'm going to actually follow through with that problem, that promise. So I, I, I'm thinking that, you know, supply chains, the existence of these supply chains could actually be a, a, a force that we can leverage to make sure that we continue seeing cooperation where it might not otherwise emerge. Dan, you buy that, Dan? Uh, that's going to be helpful. And I, th I think we need to go further. Um, I, I, there, the, we're going to have to, as Walid will know, I am a, a strong believer that the U.S. patent system has gone out of whack and is way too protective. Uh, I am concerned that China is eventually going to move in that direction when it suits their purposes, that is when they're producing the vaccines themselves. But right now what China does, uh, at least in this area of medicines, is what I think many countries should be doing, and that is compulsory licensing. That is to say to big U.S. pharmaceutical companies, uh, no, we're not going to pay outrageous prices for pharmaceutical products that you develop. Those companies will then say, well, we're not going to develop the products anymore. At which point we will say to them, that's okay. Because frankly, most of the development happens within universities. All that pharmaceutical big pharma does these days is take uh, products through clinical trials. They don't develop the drugs anymore. Like uh, we can go through a list of all the major drugs, blockbuster drugs, and realize that they were developed in universities. What we need to do is recognize this, offer the alternative to drug manufacturers. Do you want to participate at a much reduced uh, profit to yourselves? Or do you want to hand off some of this to the government? Let the government own all of these major vaccines that are developed at the public purse by universities. And as we're going to discover, I suspect, I'm not certain of this, we're going to discover that to produce 7 billion doses of a vaccine on short order is going to require resources that no single country can command and that universities and other research institutes are going to be, you know, recruited for. So to me, uh, as long as we can get past this ideology that the U.S. intellectual property rights system is the right model for the world. It is not. It, that's a consensus among economists that it's not. If we can get past that, then we can start to see that cooperation is possible. Okay, Chad, are you would you like to add anything? Or are you good? No, I think that's good. Good. So I, you know, um, we're coming up. You know, the last uh, eight minutes or so, and I initially was going to say I want to ask you a big ideas question, but there's been so many big ideas. I'm going to ask you another big idea question, and maybe I could ask Jad to, uh, Chad to think about the U.S. and Dan to think about Canada. You know, the stimulus packages that have been rolled out in Canada and the U.S. are truly historic. You know, we're estimating that the Canadian budget deficit might be $200 billion, considering the government debt is only five or $600 billion. That's a big number. And in the U.S., $1 trillion, $2 trillion, three, these are big numbers. There's this idea that in three months or six months, when these stimulus packages run out, economies are still going to be weak and they're going to have to be replaced with something. It's unlikely the US or Canadian governments are somehow going to pull back all of the stimulus and replace it with nothing. They will replace it with something. The question is what? So if I were to ask you, if you were advising government, you know, sort of big ideas about, you know, what's this, you know, Dan, you talked a few years ago about nation building ideas, these big ideas. What kind of big idea do you think the government should put in its mind when it thinks about the next stimulus packages that are definitely coming? Should it be more spending that we see now or should it be more focused on 
some kind of a vision you have. So I'm not sure who wants to go first, Chad or Dan. Chad for the U.S. maybe. So I, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm a trade economist, and I'm not a not a macroeconomist, and so this isn't where I normally spend a lot of my intellectual space. Um, but what I can do is is to you know think about how this is going to be hard. And so our our normal thinking would be you know early in this crisis we've gone um, you know to try to protect workers and to try to just get money to people, right? To, to deal with the short-term problems that the, the, that the people are gonna have. Eventually, we're going to get to the stage of trying to re-engage the economy again. Uh, and so if there's gonna be you know, government spending programs, I remember back in you know, 2008, 2009, in the United States, it was the shovel-ready programs, right? This, and so you can, there's always, ah, infrastructure infrastructure. You know what we need in the United States? Better infrastructure. The problem though is, is that going to be right this time around? Physical infrastructure, is that going to be safe, right? Is, it, is that going to be, you know, accounting for all the social distancing needs and where we are uh, and in what treatments and what testing that we have available at that moment in time? This is going to be really, really tricky. Uh, this is going to require policymakers that are nimble and, and flexible uh, and some might really creative economic advisors. And I hope you have them there in Canada. I will say here in the United States, we're not seeing a lot of this right now. I think, um, you know, this is this is a big worry. So this is definitely worth thinking hard about. I don't have any obvious uh, sil silver bullet solutions right now, uh, but I do think this is gonna be the big challenge that we're gonna face over the coming months. Dan? Well, uh, I, I think you've, well, you hit the nail on the head with the word vision. Um, you know, we're going to, we have, uh, in retrospect, not in hindsight, but in retrospect, uh, we may have put too much into this program too quickly. Uh, um, not that it was, it wasn't a mistake at the time, but we thought that this pandemic would earn, would, you know, V out quickly. And it doesn't look like it's going to V out quickly. It's going to be more like a W. Uh, and we're going to have to wait for that rebound. We're going to have to keep pouring government money into this. We're going to get to a point, not that I think it's unaffordable to the, to the Canadian people to carry a debt to GDP ratios that this is going to imply. I think it is affordable, but it is going to be very um, wrenching to the fabric of the country because unfortunately we have the sort of the conservative liberal divide in this country is also a regional divide, which really uh, troubles me. So when we decide to, um, to deal, when the, these deficits become too big to be comfortable for the conservative elements in the country, it's going to create social divisions in this country. What we need is a vision which takes us beyond that, right? And what does that vision going to look like? To me, it is to carry on our, sh on our uh, the, carry this flag of, what Canada has been great at doing. And that is we are great at areas like AI and biotech. I can look and see um, what kinds of solutions Canada can be part of in a global context. So that's two pieces here, right? It's, it's saying that the Canadian government initiatives are, are well articulated, a vision of what we want to accomplish both for Canada and for the world, communicated effectively to Canadian people, which brings some unity to what will, I think in another six months from now become fragmentation over the large deficits. And that, what will that unity, what will that message look like? To me, it says, Canada is gonna become a, a sort of a curator or a um, concierge service to help with international collaborations on pandemic solutions. That could be on the AI space with helping to develop better contacts and tracing on testing solutions, uh, because there are many, many testing solutions out there right now. We don't know which is gonna be best. Same with vaccines. Many solutions are out there in the running. We wanna stop thinking of this as a global competition and we, can, we need Canada to help reframe this as global cooperation. My solution may not be the winner, but some solution will be the winner that helps all of us. And that's what we have to carry forward not just for Canada, but I think for the, this whole planet. Well, that's uh, uh, can, can I, I interject? I think 
Canada, you are amazingly well positioned for this. I think, you know, looking ahead um, to what companies uh, are going to care about when they're thinking about, you know, setting up new production facilities or new headquarters for whatever, they're going to look for countries that govern well, that can deal with the pandemic, that aren't forced to shut down uh, their, their, their sort of entire economy because they've mismanaged it. Right. Uh, if you think about who you want to do trade agreements with, well, can you keep your economy open is kind of a big Canada. You are an amazingly right now, at least good position to be able to take advantage of this into the future where I sit. We don't look very attractive right now as a, as a reliable partner for any of these things. So congratulations and, and, and good luck. Well, I think everybody's applauding that uh, final comment and what a great way to end. I wish we had another hour, but before I thank, uh, Dan and Chad, I really want to thank the audience. I mean, the number of questions and the quality of the questions have been remarkably good. I really want to thank the audience for being so engaged with those great questions. And I'll try to collect all of those questions and maybe uh, we'll provide some answers online, but there's been so many amazing questions. But Chad and Dan, thank you so much. We know you're both incredibly busy. Thanks for preparing. And there's a lot of learnings that have jumped out. There's too many to list. But just, I think there's a big virtual applause going on. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, and I just, my closing comments, Managing Uncertainty is a weekly webinar series. I hope you can join us next week when we'll continue our look at the impact of COVID on supply chains. We'll consider a framework for disaster proofing supply chains, a topic that flows naturally from today's uh, conversation. If you missed any of our previous webinars, they're all available online at www.rotman.utoronto.ca. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Chad. Uh, this has been wonderful. Everybody have a great weekend and please stay safe. Thank you. Chad. Thank you.